compartment modeling. It's a relatively light topic. Um, and I know. It's, so basically what we're doing in compartment modeling is thinking of our body in terms of buckets. My blood is a compartment, a bucket. My liver is a compartment, a bucket. What is, what is it? It's, which means that the bucket, the way that compartment is defined is that it is well mixed. So my blood, my entire blood pool throughout my body is well mixed. And genetically homogeneous, which means that if, say, in the brain, there's some sort of rate at which a substance leaves the blood and goes into the brain, if my blood throughout the body is the same pool, then it does so at the same, it does so in the same way in the kidney as well. That's what kinetic homogeneity means, right? And so what that enables you, right, once you, ha once you start thinking of your body in terms of just these different buckets, right, you can start doing things like, so going back to the example of MRS, I talked about the infusion of a 13C labeled substance. You're also making constant measurements from the blood of 13C, and you get this sort of 13C time course from the blood itself too. And then if you think of your blood as a bucket, and then you're modeling the exit of this substance from the blood into bodily tissues, right? you can simulate you know, the dynamics of this substance in the blood. It'll be a simple differential equation with an input coming in based on the infusion, and an output just based on like a first order exit from the compartment. And so you'll get this exponential thing, and you can try and fit it to every bucket. You can build more complicated buckets if you want to. The buckets have no anatomical significance. Which should be, which would make sense, but they have physiological significance. They're kinetically homogeneous, and so a compartment model is basically just a bunch of these buckets put together, and you specify the rate constants of ex exchange or flow between these different buckets. As I mentioned with the MRS example, so one of or more of the compartments can represent where experimental measurements are being made, and then you can simulate the dynamics governing the experimental data based on your model, right? And so I think the examples might make this clearer. Here's an example from the literature about doing this for pharmacokinetics. Pharmacokinetics is what the body does to, to the drug. Pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to the body, right? Pharmacokinetics means, you know, you would hear about people talking about so sort of doctors having to closely monitor the blood levels for some drugs when they give them. Right? That's pharmacokinetics, right? You talk about renal toxicity, hepatic toxicity of different antibiotics of different drugs, that's pharmacokinetics. It's based on how much clearance is happening, so on and so forth. Um, and so basically, at a long story short, pharmacokinetic models may look something like this, where you give in a dose into a central compartment, say this is an ID drug that you're infusing or something, 200 milligrams, this is an absorption rate constant. Again, these are like first order rate constants like you have in chemistry. This is exchanging with the peripheral compartment, say tissues. But this could be tissues, and then there's some elimination happening, say, through the liver or the kidney. So you can this is a very so this is a very black box sort of approach where now you can go in and start writing differential equations, right? So DCP over DT will have an input related to Ka, an output related to Kl and K12, and another input related to K21. And you can write differential equations for this, this, and then when you integrate those differential equations, if you're making measurements in the central compartment, you'll get a solution for the central compartment. You can fit it to data that you might have. This is basically compartment. It's just literally making buckets or black boxes at different compartments, being able to think about physiological systems in ways that only an engineer will. <laughs> okay. So that's one example in uh, pharmacokinetics that comes up. And the practice problem that I've uploaded is a one compartment pharmacokinetic model, which involves some intricacies of OD45 when you're doing the integration. So I advise you to take a look at that, and we can talk about it. Another example where this comes up is with PET imaging. How many of you know about PET? What is PET? Or let's hear from there. What is PET? Uh-huh. Okay, let's let's hear let's hear from another person then. Yep, so I can quickly explain this a little bit. So MRS, there's no radioactivity in PET, there is radioactivity involved. But the substance you're giving in MRS is in substrate amounts, 
in PET is in tracer amounts, very small amounts. So actually, when the first PET demonstrations came, they didn't even need to do mouse models. They could just straight go to humans because the amount of substance you were using was so small, even though it was radioactive, it didn't matter, right? And so what you do in PET is, as was said, there are different modes of radioactive decay, alpha, beta, positron decay. You choose radioisotopes, which are beta decay radioisotopes. Then you give them in PET, and so this, this isotope, when it decays, is going to emit a positron. It meets an electron, and then two gamma rays come out in 180 degrees, right? That's called annihilation. Then on two ends, you have two scanners. You look for coincidence, right, that these two gamma rays are coming at 180 degrees. You look for them coming at the same time, and you look for both of them being 511 mega electron volts, because that defines the annihilation event. When all of these conditions are met, you say, oh, this specific positron emission must have happened somewhere along this line. And you get thousands of millions of such events, and then you have very complicated reconstruction algorithms which use all of these, and these lines of projection, as these are called, and you can actually get the spatial image. That's basically how PET works. And um, it's very useful because MR and CT are anatomical imaging modalities. You see structure in MR and CT. PET is molecular. So you could design a radioactive tracer binding to a specific receptor, say a dopamine receptor in the brain, or you could design something you know, that is involved biochemically in some kind of metabolism reaction, and, so it's, and you can then probe the system. So it's actually a molecular imaging technique as opposed to MR and CT, which are more structural. And so in PET modeling, again, um, you have a lot of different types of models, heart metal models that can be used to model what? So CA represents arterial blood here. Again, it's a bucket, right? And CA represents, so you're, you're injecting the tracer in the arterial pool. One represents, um, say, tissue where this tracer is coming out. For example, in this three compartmental model, may represent non-specific binding of this tracer, and C2 might represent specific binding of this tracer, for example. And then, based on, again, differential equations and modeling based on the data that you've acquired, you can actually estimate all of these. You can estimate um, binding affinities, for example, of, of, a, you know, of an endogenous substance to a receptor, right? You can look at receptor upregulation, downregulation, again, pretty cool because this can be done non-invasively in humans. You can look at, for example, um, after a specific intervention, have, have dopamine receptors gone up or down in the brain? Again, compartmental models are key to be able to do that kind of modeling. So another example of compartmental models. And this is just to give you a flavor of another area where compartmental models pharmacokinetics and PET modeling. And you can find yourself playing around, and if you search the literature, these papers are easy enough to understand, and sort of you can think about even in your own research projects or so on. I found myself during undergrad building a lot of these models myself, just to better be able to better understand the dynamics of the system. You can think of even when you're modeling signaling cascades, you can think of, it's pretty much a compartment model, right? A concentration pool is like a compartment, it's like a bucket. The actual biological, biological picture is very complicated because you have scaffolds and you have proteins going to places and there's spatial co-localization. Compartment modeling just throws all of that out of the window, right? The simplified view of the actual biological picture. So as I said, differential equations are the backbone of these models. And I have this example here, um, which is we can go through it together, but the reason I have this example is to tell you that you're doing mass transfer in compartment models and not concent um, or mass balance, you're not doing concentration balance. And that becomes confusing at times, which may be best demonstrated with an example. Does anybody want to volunteer to read this? 